Thanks a lot for coming along to uh, Born and Be Wide tonight. Um, it's a uh, um, most splendid turnout, and um, I'd like to sort of say that Magic, um, who some of you might have seen, has put this uh, put this evening together. So, um, big up Magic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, we've got a very illustrious panel tonight. Um, Nick from Sneaky Pete's, who's uh, never done a, a Born to Be Wide uh, panel before. In fact, most of them haven't, except for okay. Ali, but, um, but it's okay. But uh, Nick was a very late addition, and he's, uh, he's got some um, interesting, interesting ideas and views, so um, he was drafted in at the last minute. And um, I guess the best thing to do is uh, for me to stop talking and ask um, the panelists to introduce themselves. So, Ali, do you want to start, sir? Yep. Uh, my name's Ali McRae. I present a show on BBC Radio 1. These are my ears. They've just become apparent from the haircut I had about an hour ago. Uh, the girl said to me, she was like, oh, how short do you want to go? Right in there. I was like, not too short, because my ears stick out a bit. She went, oh no, son, they don't, they don't. Yes, they do. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Hi. Hello, I'm Jamie from Edinburgh Band, Jamie and Shuni. Hiya. Uh, my name's Richie, I run the Scottish Alternative Music Awards and do quite a few other wee things, but I'm going to talk tonight mainly based upon that. Hi, my name's Sarah and I do the Popcock blog. I've done it for the past year alongside Jason, so hopefully I can give some perspective on what I've found useful as like a newcomer to, to the industry and stuff like that. And I'm Nick, I run uh, Sneaky Pete's, which is a venue on the Cowgate in Edinburgh, um, and I'm the manager and booker. So I guess the uh, thing to to start with is really these uh, people all started out at one point not knowing anyone and or not knowing anyone that worked in music and they've gone to that to all knowing lots of people um, all done it through different means <laughs> and um, I guess the first thing is uh, Jamie how did you end up um, going from walking in a, a music project at a football club to selling out the Liquid Room Annex and about a year later. Well, when um, I first went to Tyne Castle, it was the music box is when I first met uh, Michael Lambert, who went there and uh, he introduced me things that I'd never known before, such as like Sonic Bids, PRS, and that kind of opened my eyes to what kind of the other side of music rather than just writing stuff in your bedroom and things like that. So from then and uh, forming a band, getting introduced to Born To Be Wide, coming along and uh, getting introduced to industry professionals and other musicians like-minded, just kind of building it from there to kind of make what we're doing now. And how did you, how did you first get noticed? Well, um, it's kind of funny we start, because from the, the first thing that we kind of done, I can remember as a milestone, we, we literally walked into Asda and uh, started playing, playing one of our songs, and uh, we filmed it and put it on YouTube, and uh, a lot of people kind of seen that, and we, we got a, a kind of a bit of a buzz about us because of that. So a, a random event from that, we kind of uh, built upon it, we got asked to come on to Real Radio, and from then, like this kind of, a seminar talking about making friends and stuff. I can point out one, a weird one from there, that complete random story. Uh, the manager for Asda, we still actually talk to him to this day. It's insane because that, that first time, we never asked to do any of that. We just, we just walked in for a laugh and done that. And then uh, since going on the radio, I emailed them and, and uh, he said, oh, it was a bit cheeky, but we support you. So I was like, cool, well, can we come and do a gig? And he said, he said, hi, I come and do a gig. So we went in, drum kit, amps, done the works. And uh, since then, he does posters for us. He's, he's still, we keep, he's on the mailing list. He, he, he sends us like covers for our phones. So we, 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 we've got some cool wee relationship going there. It's weird. So I just, I want my free chicken like when I go in, like, but I've not got that yet. But uh, I, it's, it's weird because I, I still give him the updates and he's gave us the okay to shoot a scene in there when we finally come making the official video for that song. So even at the weirdest times for the weirdest things, the most random events, you can always make a contact somewhere or another. And it's about maintaining that. So that, that kind of attitude has kind of helped us 
kind of when we go to meet um, people, whether it's bands or whoever, to try and make an impression and sustain it. Ali, you just sort of bounded in talking about your haircut and yeah. you <laughs> speak to lots of people um, on the radio, on the telly sometimes. Uh-huh. When you started out, how did you get to know people and were you that outgoing back in those uh, days? Absolutely not. And I still feel like I'm pretty shy. There's a lot of times when I'll go to Radio 1 in London, like last weekend, and I'll see a couple of different presenters who I know personally, and I'll still be like, holy crap, they're pretty famous. That's a, that's a real famous right there. Um, and I, I've, I've always felt a bit like that. You know, maybe I'm pointing out my years because I've always been a bit like, oh my God, whatever, self-conscious, worry o'clock. But um, I guess when I was at uni, I was just out having a lot of fun and I met a lot of people in bands. And that was really why I've got my job. It's not because I am anywhere near a professional level of radio presenter, but that's not what Radio 1 want. Radio 1 wants someone who knows a lot of bands, who knows a lot about that world, who can then reflect it on air. I mean, were I to read the shipping forecast or do voiceovers or make audiobooks, I'd be hoaching at it. (laughs) But if I get to go on air and talk about like new MCs from Edinburgh or whatever, then I can do that. Um, And it took a while for me to realise that's why I'm on Radio 1, because I spent ages going, who oh, could I do this? I sound like that. I don't know this person. I don't know that person. But I'm there for a reason. And once you realise that, it, meant it gives you a bit of worth. How did you approach those bands in the early days? I mean, you did student radio, didn't you? Yeah. Is um, that, did you go into that after you already knew some bands or what, was, what came first? Well, I suppose the rock and roll story that uh, me and my friend Weaver, who we were doing the show with, have been dining off of since then, is that... Uh, my friend was in a band who knew a drummer in this band called Twin Atlantic, who then were not, had done nothing. They'd not done very many gigs outside of Glasgow or Edinburgh. And uh, I was like, oh, I sound all right. We want to get them up for a session, kind of through friend of a friend. And then the drummer who set it up didn't even want to be in the session because they'd never done a session before. And he didn't, he was like, no, nah, acoustic sessions, we're a rock band. We don't do that. But the rest of the band were like, cool, yeah, we'll go up. And uh, we filmed it and stuff, and it's all on the internet. We've all got much more embarrassing haircuts, probably excluding mine. Um, and that went online, and that was the first ever session they've done. And then, you know, lots of things transpired. <laughs> but we did about maybe 28 sessions that year, and I, one out of 28 is not bad for one of them sort of blowing up. But yeah, it was absolutely through just pure chance uh, and asking friends and friends of friends to see if they'd come up and play music, because there wasn't any live music on the station at the time. And did you feel shy about doing that, or did you just say, oh, I've got a radio show, do you want to come on it? Uh, I was probably a bit shy about it, because again, it had been the sort of case that we wanted to make this show exist, but neither of us really wanted to present it or knew how to. So we were a bit just kind of like, uh, I don't know how to do this, but come on. And we didn't have the proper equipment. It was like, in the video, you can actually see me holding the mic in front of the, cause, in front of the guitar, because we didn't have a stand. So, you know, it was just that kind of <laughs> chance in your arm. You never know. So, Sarah, was that your experience when you when you first started um, writing about bands? Did you have to seek them out yourself, or what was the what was the sequence for you? Well, my degrees in English literature, so I've always wanted to write, and then I knew a lot of people who were in local bands around about the Stirling area, and so I went to I went to gigs, local gigs, quite a lot, and started writing gig reviews and just putting them up on my own Facebook page, and then. One day, out of chance, I, I emailed Jason. I don't even know his name was Jason at the time. His name was just the Pop Cop. I emailed the Pop Cop <laughs> and um, asked him if I could write for him. And it was just by chance that the girl who'd been helping him with the features at the time, Erica, she was leaving. And he said, right, well, if you can think of something for me to um, like, something to write a feature about and I like it, then, yeah, you can do it from then on. And then that's what we've been doing, really. So I asked. <laughs> and um, do you interview a lot of artists or um, do, do you find yourself having to cold call people if you're wanting to write about them? Um, mainly, it's a, mainly email based just now. Um, Jason's always like, do you have a dictaphone? <laughs> like that's a normal request. And I'm like, no, I don't have a dictaphone. But um, that's something that I'm starting to do more often is like meeting up with people, having face-to-face interviews, and it's something that is a bit, a bit nerve-wracking if you've never met somebody before. But um, it's something that I'm look, looking to do more and like verge away from the email-based interviews for the blog. What do you when you say it's nerve-wracking? I mean, what do you find nerve-wracking about it? It's 
out with your comfort zone, really, to go and completely meet somebody new and say, hi, I'm going to ask you questions. Like, it's a, it's a bit of an odd concept, you know, just to sit down and say, right, that's fine, I'll, I'll see you later, and then you can see what I'm going to say about you later on, somewhere on the, on the web, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, it's a bit of an odd concept to just sit down with somebody that you've never met before and then leave them half an hour later. But... I think we'll come back to sort of how you, you overcome that um, in a little mm -hmm. while and also that whole idea of what your your comfort zone is, what what's the kind of what is normal, I guess what are abnormal social situations. Uh, Richie, I mean, you've uh, gone from being a, a student to launching the Scot um, Scottish Alternative Music Awards while you're still at university. How did you end up doing that? I mean, how did you pull that um, all those people together to actually get it off the ground. It's quite a long story, but um, we've got time. <laughs> before I started the awards, bizarrely, um, I keep seeing this advert on MTV, and it was to sign up and walk around Germany to the MTV Awards with a lot of people you'd never met before. And I was quite, I was like twenty at the time, and I was like, that could be quite good fun. So I was the only, like one of the only Scottish people to sign up and I got accepted. So we walked from Hamburg to Berlin over 10 days to the MTV Awards. And one of us got to give out an award live on stage and that was my friend Gillian from Ireland. So that was all quite surreal when you see it in place. And I knew none of these people and now some of them are my best friends. Some of them fly over, some are coming tomorrow to the Samas. And I guess I was quite shy for the first few days doing that and then I kind of came out of my shell towards the end. So I think by just doing, I don't know, going out of your comfort zone can make you a bit stronger as a person. And then I started to work for Red Bull afterwards. You've got to be really social for that. You've got to be drink a lot of product as well. <laughs> and then I, th I guess you just kind of get used to that. But I'm cer I certainly used to be really quiet. I used to play a lot of progressive metal and metal bands and I used to lock myself away and play 10 hours of shred a day. Now I, now I don't do that. <laughs> but I guess the fan walk really made me a lot more social and it was a great experience. I'm really lucky to be able to do that. It doesn't exist anymore. But Jesus, it was tiring by the end of it, you know, 10 days later when you're in Berlin and it's snowing and all that. Where did you sleep? Uh, one night was maybe in like a hostel, so it was really rough and it's only cold showers. But then the next night was maybe like a five-star golf resort in the middle of nowhere. So it really, uh, it really changed per night. And when you set up the Samas, um, how did you go about approaching people? Did you email them or did you call them? Well, at, at the beginning, you know, you're basing, you're saying to someone, oh, you should buy into this idea that doesn't exist. You know, you've got nothing to back up that it's going to be or become really good. So you're kind of doing it on trust that they trust you to, to be accurate in what you do. So we started really small, you know, 130 people, I think, were at the show. And approaching sponsors in the way that, you know, we don't need any investment, we would love it, but we don't, we'll just go for it, you know, we want to make something happen. And we just started slowly and we were really honest, I think, and we had a good plan in terms of what we wanted to do. So. And, you know, when it came to nominating the bands or the, the different uh, categories, um, when it came to getting sponsorship, did you just uh, pull that together or did you get in touch with people and ask them to, to nominate artists as well? So it's a really complicated process if you want to do it really well. You need to spend a lot of time researching. So the beauty I had was going to the MTV Awards and seeing the kind of commercial side of how that works and then flipping that almost on its head because I'm, I care about the artists that are more underground who have been working a hell of a lot harder than some of them and I want to focus with them. So... I kind of decided which, which regions we should have involved. So you're looking at places like Inverness, Stirling, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Ayrshire, etc., And then selecting people in those regions who you feel are full-time and really care and passionate about the, the music to make a really strong judgment of who should be nominated. Um, and I'm also very aware that, you know, it's, it's, a, an, and it's an idea of who what's going on in Scotland, obviously we can't have everyone involved, otherwise it would be a bit different. <laughs> and um, Nick, did you start out as a, a DJ before you owned a venue and became a, a promoter, 
what came first? Well, it's a kind of it's a mess of sorts. I was loads and loads of different things before I started taking things seriously. I'd gone from working um, when I was quite late, uh, maybe 26. I was working about 80 hours a week as a head chef, and then I'd managed to land a really much much easier job working for uh, Valvon and Crawler. I was getting paid the best wages of my life, but only 32 hours a week. So it was a nice wee drop. And that just actually, for the first time in forever, gave me a bit of spare time. And when I lost that chefing job, because I was surplus to requirements, because I was getting too well paid for not enough hours, which is why I had the free time in the first place, um, I went, well, do you know what? I'll give this a wee go. And I started putting on a couple of gigs. Um, very luckily, a couple of friends that I knew had given me some DJ gigs. So that filled in a bit. And then I started working for Cabaret Voltaire. Um, where I was promoter, barman, um, and two days a week I was the cleaner as well. Um, so uh, Cabaret Voltaire were going to buy a little club called Red Vodka Club, but they never actually did it. But they sent me down as a manager in the meantime for a year. And after a year I went, Sarah, um, you don't seem to have bought this club. <laughs> uh, Michael, who was the owner, went, well, do you want to buy it? And I went, yeah. So um, the, my dad got a bank loan. We bought the lease together with uh, a business partner that I got, uh, Paul from PCL Concerts. Um, and we picked the place up, and we're going to be six years on from that pretty soon now. God, six years? Seem, doesn't <laughs> seem like that long, eh? So, congratulations. Feels really <laughs> um, <laughs> you've not aged a day, yeah? Um, when you were starting out, when you, you went and you played these, these records at this early stage, did you have any nerves about it or were you just like right i'm just gonna go and get it stuck in well not really because i was non-ambitious i was doing something kind of for fun and would see what happened and really it took about two two and a half years into sneaky beats where i realized i had to stop djing in other bars for a living i had to stop um repping all the shows for pcl and i had to start actually concentrating on just making the business make money so that it existed i mean we were fairly busy from the start but there's there's a hazy bit where you realize that if you've got a business that you really love you don't get to have it unless it unless it makes money because there's no losing money and making money. There's just, it's open or shut. So we had to really put in proper efforts into the business to turn it into the busy place it is now. And um, when, you've, uh, when you've been working there, you've, I've, been in, um, I've been in Sneaky Pete's where, you know, I've seen a band that none of my, my kind of network or circle of friends has talked about, but they've, they've sold the place out. I mean, you see a lot of different types of acts and I imagine you see quite a lot that have uh, managed to pull this uh, feet off, just filling the place and selling out a gig that they promoted themselves. I mean, are you kind of talking about local bands there? Yeah. I mean, are there any traits that you think they have? Are there any particular things that you've noticed with uh, local bands that are, are successful? Well, you know, at my level, it's kind of a 100 capacity. If you sell it out... You, and you've done it as a local band, you've probably done it through a really good network of friends. Once you start looking at like a, a larger level beyond that, I think it's very interesting when you get a band who've got, say, a local band playing, and they're maybe second on the bill. They've got 10 pals, but they've got 20 people who heard that they were good and came to see them. That's a much more significant step for me than it is getting all your friends to come and see you. And that says something about the band. And that band tends to be better than the band who sold us out with 100 of their pals and their aunts and their aunties and this time of year we get a lot of kind of like Napier Uni shows and Julianesque shows where they're, they're doing their own showcases they're hiring us out they never mentioned that they're from uni unless you get a wee email saying oh have you got a risk evaluation report for this game <laughs> so we get a little bit of that um, and those shows all tend to do really well but we don't tend to, tend to see the standard of excellence of when people are just going I've heard that this band are good and I'm going to go down for that so what kind of um, network is it that leads to that? I mean, do you find the bands that go to, that you see at other people's gigs are the ones that tend to do better themselves or pick up better audiences? So I find that bands that are really good at playing and really good at songwriting and, and really good at developing audiences actually is, are, are people who go see lots of other people's gigs. That bit where you rock up on stage and then the drummer fucks about for four minutes kind of hitting things while someone tunes for another four minutes or something. The more shows you go and see and the more good bands you go and see, the better your standard performance is going to be because you automatically know what the parameters are. You know, if you ate fish and chips every night and then you want to invite your friends around to your house for an incredible five-star meal, but you've not been eating five-star meals, you wouldn't know what it was. So you have to go and see as often as possible, all the best bands play to know what that is, to know what that performance is. When you were, uh, when you were starting out, Sarah, I mean, did you, 
did you find that there were certain things with the bands that you were interviewing that helped you helped you overcome nerves or where you 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 know basically managed to you know get back into a certain comfort zone are there any sort of preparations that you would do um i think there's always a, an amount of preparation you should do before you do an interview you should do some basic research you need to have things to talk about in the first instance but it genuinely helps if people are just themselves a bit more like today's the first day i've met jamie and he's like <laughs> You. <laughs> you know, and, like it's just talking away and completely puts everybody at ease. If you're yourself, if someone else is himself, and then people can have a normal conversation. It's not an, a pretense of being something else. You know, you can kind of relax into it a bit more. So, what about when um, you've got musicians that are nervous? I mean, do you ever find folk that just really they're just a bit uptight and don't really want to speak, although they've agreed to do an interview with you? Um, well, I've not found that so far. I've not had an experience of that so far, but if that were to be the case, then I'd try my best to put somebody at ease. I don't think I would make anybody feel uncomfortable, you know. But um, I've had experiences where, you've, where I've spoken to bands who have agreed to do interviews and questions and things, like online, via email, and, um, and then I end up chasing them up, and they're like, yeah, I'll, I'll get it to you, I'll get it to you, and then it, the day never comes. So... Um, I would say that's a big thing. If you're going to commit to something, then commit to it. And if, and if you can't any longer, it's not a big deal. Just let somebody know and they can arrange for something else to happen. Richie, what about you? I mean, are there, do you find that with the musicians that you work with, are there, are there any sort of, do you ever find you have to coax people out of their shell or um, get them to engage a bit? Um, well, in terms of, in terms of Samas, you know, everyone, I don't, I don't, tell people you need to go on a big voting campaign or anything, but it's maybe to your advantage to try it because you could open up new audiences around Scotland. You know, people who might never have heard of you might start coming to your show, you know, but I don't, they don't need to do that at all. Um, sometimes there's a lot of bands that are quite held back due to the genre of their music. It's not, you don't need to go viral with their marketing. I wouldn't expect a death metal band to to put a sticker through my door and uh, vote for this band. But maybe a pop band might want to do that. So uh, there's different ways for everyone to do it. For me, it's more about the artists kind of putting in some work, in, which is the music, and for me to pass the message to the audience. And so far, it's been really good. I think we had, we had over 24,000 votes this year, so that's pretty incredible. And we had 12,000 in just over 48 hours. So. My phone was going mental. <laughs> Ali, do you find yourself in a situation still now where you go on air and you're, you're just shitting yourself a oh, little bit? Ab absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Um, and that's good. That's a good thing to be a little bit nervous. Uh, and like I said, I still get nervous when I meet various people. I get nervous when I meet you, Olaf. Yeah. Quite intimidating when character. I meet you too. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, how do you overcome it? I mean, are there the, obviously there's the the preparation mm -hmm. that, that Sarah has mentioned um, that you, I guess you know as much as about as possible about an artist. Um, are there any other things that you that you would recommend? Well, I think the biggest realization for me came probably after been working for Radio One for a couple of years. It's invariably well definitely if you're interviewing bands that's that's one thing they need something from you they need to come off good like you were saying you can write something and it'll appear online they need it to be good yeah. <laughs> unless they want to portray some kind of image that is i don't know they're trying to be arses or whatever but you know invariably definitely with bands they need the, the promotion from you um but even in terms of a personal one-to-one -one basis whether you want to be a radio presenter or whether you want to be a producer or you're a, a musician or whatever you're doing within these kind of realms. In fact, it probably counts for any profession. If you hold back and be nervous and see someone in a position of power, who, or maybe not even a position of power, a position where you would aspire to be or you think you could get something from them, if you just chill out and think about it rationally, say you're a promoter and you want to speak to a manager of a band who you really want, then there's no point in you, you know, emailing them and not returning it because that's easy to forget. If you have the balls to walk up to them and go, hey, by the way, uh, run this venue. For instance, Sneaky Beats gets a level of artist who would never play a 100-person venue you know, anywhere else unless there was that personal connection. You know, What you can offer is a great service, a great crowd, whatever. And 
you never know if that might be the right time in the band's career or the band's time when they need a smaller show that's going to be absolutely go off you know and you never know that until you make that connection and if you actually walk up to someone and say hey i do this you do that you're going to get a straight answer as opposed to like a 15 paragraph email telling me what your granny's surname is and then yeah it's easily ignorable I guess. How do you manage to get all these amazing Yeah, that's blown my mind. Uh, Errol, okay, um, Errol, okay. You know, how, how have you built those those relationships? Well, I'm I'm on site repping all the gigs that are in-house, at least, and I tend to be there elsewhere. I mean, I've, I still pull pints in the bar a lot. Um, so I'm there all the time. Um, part of it's been personal. Some, some of it is just we've got a pretty decent standard production. You go in, you're going to sound good, you're going to get well-treated, you'll probably get fed. Um, we'll give you a choice of beer or whatever else you want to drink, and that tends to go pretty well. But I think, actually, I was thinking about this the other day, it used to be that Edinburgh had a gig booker for every venue, and now there seems to be two venues with a full-time gig booker, in, as in someone who'll actually go out and look for shows, and that's Sneaky Beats, and that's the Electric Circus. So... There's a quite small audience, really. If you're if you're an agent, and we've gotten to that stage now where most of the shows that we do are shows where people have come to us and said, or rather agents, sometimes for large bands, have gone, you know, we need an Edinburgh show, speak to Nick. We need an Edinburgh show, speak to Tala, who works here. Um, and it's a choice of the two until until you're talking about one of the larger promoters doing show, bigger venue, Liquid Room, and then suddenly there's no other venues in Edinburgh, actually. <laughs> So did you did you build those relationships? I mean, I not understand the agents, but with yeah. um, with the artists themselves. Well, we do sometimes. Uh, a lot of the time, a DJ comes back to see us, and we do even more DJ shows than we do um, gigs. Um, then we just try and treat them very personally, and there's a there's a nice amount of friendliness, a nice amount of kind of distance as well. You say about like kind of approaching people. Um, not being afraid to speak to someone, which is nice. And if you know, if you're just confident about the way that you do your job because you're used to doing a lot of shows, that goes really well. But at the same time, I find that DJs and musicians don't really like you to be there interviewing them as if, as if Ali was doing his job, really. It's very much more like, have you seen the football? I don't follow football, but you know, you, you have that chat. You have a personal chat on a really personal level, and you just kind of make that stage of the tour, because touring is really, really hard, a little bit easier. And then they're happy to see you. And, I mean, do you find that um, it's better to approach musicians on a, I guess... Uh a more personable level after the show, um, do they tend to be quite nervous or jittery beforehand? No, people tend to kind of head off after the show, to be honest, you know? If, if we get a, a band coming in for a dance at the club afterwards, which does sometimes happen, I tend to like earmark them as problem people a wee bit, to be honest, because most bands, <laughs> most bands don't do that. It's fun when they do, and it's nice if we happen to have made a connection. If bands come back for like the third time, I'll happily take them out for a drink after that, but... I, I don't think schmoozing is a great thing to do, and I, I don't think it's particularly professional. If you happen to get on, so much the better. The general attitude should just be to be open and friendly. It's arts admin, you know. I don't think I don't think I'm a I don't think I'm in a position where I'm influential, like Ali or something like that. I literally think I'm an arts administrator, and I should do that job well. Ali, do you find yourself in a situation sometimes where you have to you have to calm the artists down, where you have to kind of make them feel at ease when they're coming uh, coming on air. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's when we used to do sessions in the show back when it was in Scotland, it was, you know, nine times out of ten, it was the first time these guys have been on the radio, let alone Radio 1. You know, huge thing. Sometimes that would be nationwide as well. So, number one, they are going to be nervous. Like they're going to be like, whoa, this is alien. This is weird. They've had a row off my producer about do not swear and all they can think about is saying fuck. That's all they can think about, right? <laughs> You know, we've told them we'll pull the plug and all that stuff. So there's a lot of things going on. So yeah, when it was in that situation, 100%, it was about going, right, it's going to be cool. And I'd just go down, much like you said there, I would just go down to the green room like an hour before the show, just be like, what's up? And you know, that at the time I'd be like, oh, I'm just I'm just hanging out. But I forget that, yes, I am a Radio 1 DJ and that would be intimidating for, like when I was 17 and in a band. So I'd sit down and just level them and, you know, maybe talk about the football, laugh about the fact I'm a St. Mun fan, whatever. And then I put someone on a level. They're just like, ah, someone's got to be. And um, then, but likewise, at Tea in the Park last year, I had to interview Professor Green, who I didn't know a great deal about, you know, not someone I'm much of a fan of, but I'd done loads of research into him and known my stuff. And his plane was late. So he was going on stage at like, say it was like, I think it was like half six or seven or something. And he literally flew in 
an hour before to Glasgow, got shipped right there. And there was literally about 20 minutes before he went on stage. And his people were like, oh, the interview's done, the interview's done. But someone must have said to him. And he was like, no, no, I'll still do that interview, don't worry. That dude had like 20 minutes to get on stage. And he just sat down with me, some nervous little guy from Glasgow going, all right, man, who's it going? I've never been on the telly before. So did you. <laughs> and he was a total don. He was a total don. But that was a different thing because I had to very quickly establish a rapport with this guy and be like, all right, what's up, man? How's it going? Oh, man, must have been a nightmare. I really appreciate you doing that. It's really good of you. Because it, was, it wasn't like it was, I don't know, a live broadcast around the world on 800 channels. It was BBC Scotland, the pre-recorded interview, five minutes. But to his credit, he still did it. And that was obviously a level of professionalism from his years of touring. But in that moment, I had to be like, assess his mood because he could be pissed and he could have been like forced into do it by his manager. But I quickly found out he was just there because he was a bit of a dude. And I had a little chat and that made me relax, made him relax. So it was, it was kind of the two extremes of the, the, the music industry, but I still had to assess how those people are feeling very quickly. So if you're meeting a, a stranger and you are nervous, I mean, what kind of things put you at ease? <laughs> Uh, put me at ease yeah. or put them at ease you. put me as if they're just on a total level if they're just like hi or if they smile at you something as simple as that um, I guess it's just just a human response because there is I'm sure there's, it's easy to build someone up in your head or, or, or believe especially if they are a famous You'll, you'll have read loads of things about them or heard they could be terrible to interview for example uh, who has heard of Fred from Spectre that indie band who were famous a while ago. Um, yeah, I ah, the guy who wears around glasses, right? Notoriously a nightmare in interviews because he's you know, very, very loud, huge character, and you know he's eaten a few interviewers alive in his time. Mm -hmm. I had to interview him last year, and I was like, oh god, this is gonna go terribly. I'm not even that into his band at all. This is gonna be horrid. And I sat down with him, and we had a bit of time before. I made sure there was time before the interview, and I just spoke to him as a human. I was just like, what's up? You probably don't know who the hell I am. We we're working for a corporate. And I think you're more famous than he is, Ali. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I think it's, <laughs> maybe it wouldn't have been true a year ago. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I sat down with him, and again, we had that moment alone when he wasn't able to show off in front of anyone. But I did get the feeling this guy likes to talk. So I looked at all the questions I'd prepared a day ago. I was like, let's just leave that. So Fred, how are you? And he just talked. Literally for 15 minutes, I was like, yep, uh-huh, cool. Yeah, and it was great because I, I hadn't butted in. And I'm sure if I butted in going, no, 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 I've got this question. He would have got really antsy and been nasty. But after it, he was over the moon. He was great. He had his moment to shine. And my mate Ewan had to edit it down to about three minutes. So <laughs> I, I had a great time. <laughs> Um, Jamie, how did have you ever actually sort of been nervous when approaching folk, or even the ASDA thing? I mean, were you were you not even slightly afraid that some security guy was going to come and um, come and attack you, or sort of? Well, that's you what we were kind of expecting and hoping for. We were a bit let down when it never happened, but Aww. everyone else seemed to like it. So, no, um, well, I don't know. I just, I just like talking to people when it comes to to regards to. Um, getting into your music and stuff. The one thing that I that I had to kind of like train myself to do was actually talk to people before I was even in the band. Uh, I would I'd just go about to gigs, local gigs, and I was just fascinated by like people and like music and stuff. And uh, so I was just getting my face kind of known within everyone that was doing music and stuff like that. So when it came to to doing our music, it was just about try get friends with as many many people as possible because like the the music that I was into, it's always kind of been under the radar stuff and uh, just just getting to into talking to people the more you do it the, mo the more easier it gets so it's just like like um, the first time I met Ali I was like oh god I was like eh, we were in Asda <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I knew that story already yeah Sorry. I knew that story already and I thought it was amazing yeah. I was like genius and I always remember it so it, it comes to the, the same more coming to these type of things especially when it comes to like your Ali McCrae's your Vic Galloway's they're here to talk to to you guys so anyone in the audience if if you're feeling a wee bit itsy. This is why the people on the panel are here to help you, especially at this. It might be a bit different if you were on, like, maybe on a date or something, and I was like, Ellie, <laughs> me, hey. That has actually helped. But, um, but yeah, yeah, but the, the, the thing is, like, we've, we've actually seen each other a good few times, and um, the, the, the difference is, if I've not got anything new going on, it's not like I'm just going to, like, 
but in our saying and we'll acknowledge each other and stuff and it's fine. Um, so there's always that acknowledgement that can be there, which is, is just as good as a full blown conversation as well. So getting in way, when, when you're starting out, I think the two most important things you should be doing is getting friends with uh, other, other musicians, other bands and your fans. You need to build it with your fans. That's your bread and butter right there. Because even after two years, it was almost two years ago, and we've still got people who have been to nearly every single one of our Edinburgh shows who are still bringing new people. They're still bringing, bringing a show uh, in October, and we still have the, the person that's been at nearly every single gig just bringing like five and six people, brand new, whether they get like a new job or a new set of friends, and, and that, that's kind of like priceless to you, and it comes back to the thing where, um, and whoever it is, and wherever you are in music, you, have, you can't just expect people to do anything for you, you can't expect somebody to like your band or help you out, you have to give them something in return, so whether it's a fan, you need to give them like, Music, good music, the first one, a good show, if, if like a good uh, experience for them to remember. If you know it's somebody's birthday and the crowd say happy birthday, get the crowd singing it, that type of thing people remember. When it comes to promoters or things like that, you're wanting to, to give them tickets, give them, give them a, a reason to come to your show and then it's up to yourself to blow them away and stuff like that. And other artists, um, if you're going to be sharing their music, they, everyone can link up these days with the tags and stuff. I, I always post up music that I'm into. It's, it's not necessarily like people that I know, but they're all in uh, within Scotland and music. And it's, it's cool because being in music, you can en end up meeting those type of people. So I usually put up, oh, I'm into this, check this out. So it's introducing other bands to my fans. And then when people start noticing that, they can then return the favor, sharing your music, going to wee festivals, you can end up meeting them, becoming mates with them. And then it, it opens up to gig swapping and a whole lot of things. So doing those two things, first and foremost, getting um, friends with other musicians, other acts and your own fans and, and kind of building it for there is I think the first two steps that you need to kind of go for, for, for running to like Ali and stuff. So then, because getting a, a play on, on your show and that is brilliant, I think. But um, if you've got all the, the two things first, you've got other people to get excited about it. So Absolutely. I think, um, sorry if there's any lecturers in the audience, but you just summed up like four years of music business or whatever <laughs> in one Kanye West style monologue. That was amazing. <laughs> just wish you go home. Biggest McDonald's. <laughs> Seriously, nailed it. That was it. I think the, the exchange thing's a really interesting point because I think a lot of people will go out and they're like, well, why would they want to hear my band? Why would that person be interested? What could I possibly have of interest to them? And um, you've, you've described quite a, quite a few things. So when you're, you're starting out, I think part of it is, you know, have it just actually engaging with folk. I mean, I'll be totally honest, if someone's been a few born to be wives, I'm far more inclined to help them out than um, if it's just someone that gets in touch with me when they've got a, you, you know, a college or a university assignment and they, they need some answers. It's just like, well, you can see that someone's actually going out there and even if they are shy, it's not so much about that. It's actually that they're making an effort. And I think that... Um, with uh, you know you Sarah obviously if you're if you're interviewing bands or you know you guys you've put in a, a band on or you've got someone for the awards then there's already an, an element of an exchange there um, but I mean did you when you were doing the the radio show I mean was there was it quite hard to get people to Are you talking when I was at university? Yeah, when you're at university. Yeah, pretty hard indeed. Like I'd ask loads about, oh, we've got this radio station, you want to come on it? And to me, that's like a big thing. Didn't tell them that about 16 people listened per, per show. But we thought, we'll film it, you know, we'll do these things that has given you something. And the amount of apathy there was towards it, I was like, oh, oh well, fair enough. So we had to keep doing it, keep asking, keep going. Then we got Frank Turner randomly on one of his first tours of the UK. <laughs> Everybody was knocking at our door. It was mental, and it was just it's that so one. It's so funny, that isn't it? Because we had that when we used to. I used to stalk people to <laughs> try and get them to DJ at Born to Be Wide. This used was before to. we had uh, seminars. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't have to. <laughs> um, the uh, but it's it was 
no, no one would actually support it in the local scene. Or not no one, but very few um, of the more established um, acts would give us the time of day. And then as soon as Teenage Fan Club had done it, um, so a Glasgow band comes and does it, and the go-betweens, um, who are they, Australian or from New Zealand? Is, well, anyway, one of the go-betweens came and did it, and Pat and Evan, the footballer, did it the same night. And then suddenly everyone was like yeah. returning my calls and going, oh yeah, we'd like a Every shot. Every former Hibs player was trying <laughs> But you know, Ali, it's, it surprises <laughs> me that Mirren, people yeah. weren't like really keen necessarily to your radio show because oh, okay. I know that, like, well, from my experience, I've almost never been turned down by a local band for a gig. I, 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 probably about three times. Yeah, we don't pay great, but we offer a ticket share. You know, if you want to, if you want to bring a lot of people, you can make a bit of money. But essentially, pretty much every band in my experience will want to be on stage and play under any circumstances. They really want to do it. So it surprises me that some oh, people necessarily wouldn't. I guess it was coming to Sterling to a little. Converted toilet oh. that it basically was. Um, maybe it wasn't the glamorous thing. But um, I think th this is, I mean, all of you will know this already, but it's worth saying that you never know where anybody is going to be in the future. Like we've, we met one here, here one night, you know, and I never know what collaboration you're going to go on and do in the future. But that's why, the, you know, you, you will get people, you will come across people in all walks of life who will just be like, <clears throat> and snub you. We were talking about it earlier on, how people that will assess the room and go and talk to the most important person and that. It's like, well, you never know if the person you've just bashed your way by is going to be your boss one day at a major record label. You never know. And it must be harder to be a, can I say cunt? Must be harder to be <laughs> must be harder to be one of them than to just be civil. God, I think this is there. a really good point actually because I, I can remember I used to go uh, um, a, you know, a branch of Universal in, when I worked in London, and there was this really grumpy receptionist that looked so <laughs> bored. And um, I was always nice to her and um, would chat to her and stuff. And about three years later, by which time I was just freelance because I had been made redundant, and I phoned up uh, another label and this friendly voice was like, oh, hello, Lef. And it was her, the, the grumpy receptionist had been promoted to some kind of uh, reasonable role at a, a record company that didn't really know me as a journalist. and. You know, that's just one example of many. I think that it is a, it is a really good thing to actually be be civil. But I, I also think it is interesting when you when you are wanting someone from something from someone else that doesn't know you to maybe make some kind of gesture like I've had it where I've spent an hour, you know, of my time helping someone out and giving them an advice and then you know, I'd have ended up paying for um, the coffee if it weren't for the fact that my card got knocked back and um, they wouldn't take cards over a fiver or something. So he had to buy it in the end. But I mean, it's that kind of thing that, you know, I'd always, from my perspective, is I want something from someone or then I'd, I would offer in that sort of instance. And it doesn't have to be a massive thing. Um, I mean, do you have any suggestions for you know, those kind of, um, I suppose those things that do involve an exchange, if it's someone going like, do you want a, do you want a beer or do you want a, um, is there something I can do? You know, some people will go as, oh, we don't have any cash to come to wide days. And I'm like, well, do you want to take some posters out? We need someone to take some posters out. And then suddenly they find the cash, um, <laughs> you know, or they just don't come, yeah. Um, and. I mean, what kind of things, Richie, do, you know, can you think of or have you done yourself or, or vice versa when you're, when you're starting out where there's, I guess, almost a kind of barter there? Well, when I started out, we had zero budget. And to run an award show, you need some money. Simple things like posters, uh, event hire, paying artists, rider, marketing, awards, more posters more awards, it can go on. But to start these conversations with the people we're kind of talking about, you need to be able to offer something. And when you're a, a, a really young student and you don't have much, apart from a really bad hangover from the MTV Awards, that can be quite tough, but it can be as simple as a, buying someone a beer or a coffee and sitting down and being personal and being, this is what we're going to do. This is, the, this is the six, seven month plan for the awards. You've got the opportunity here to be one of the first investors in it. <laughs> How does that sound? You know, you could be the first Glasgow studio, perhaps, or you could be the, the first bar that we're going to have the after party in. So sitting down and being realistic with these people and having a clear plan, you know, if I go in and change things, the, 
next day, that's not going to look very good. So going in and knowing exactly what's going to benefit them. So if it's, let's say, for example, the after party was here, that we're going to fill the room out and make sure everyone buys a pint of Heineken at the bar or a, a cocktail. Simple little details like that. And it can be as simple as adding up figures. So if there's 100 people in the room at four pounds a pint, that's going to, that's one. But if, if everyone spends 20 pounds, you know, that's a lot more profit. So simple things for me have just been sitting down with people and, and getting to know them, letting them get to know me. And when you build up that trust and respect amongst each other, things kind of become easier. Well, they certainly should. Um, so for me, it's, it's been good, but it's been just sitting down and getting to know people and businesses. Do you think it's also a matter of sharing? I mean, the uh, just to, so you know, I mean, Richie and I uh, studied together for a year, and one of the things that struck me in the, with everyone in that environment was the people, at the beginning, we just had a conversation about whether, you know, you hide your homework or you you share it and everyone would agreed that like let's let's share what we know in our contacts and and i often find that um you know that makes you more inclined to help other people and i think that's part of the you know building a network you're not necessarily going out drinking together but there is you can pick up the phone to someone knowing that they would do the same same for you i mean does yeah I, absolutely when it comes to me and my sponsors i'm really um loyal for a start so first of all I'll be approaching them probably Monday or Tuesday to wrap up for next year, hopefully. Um, but again, if it's someone like, let's say, Gorbo Sounds, who are my main sponsor, if they're doing, doing a, a winter sale on the studio so you get a discount, I'm going to, just out of decency and kindness, share that to my on all my channels and hopefully they'll get some more business out of it. So it's, and then return, whoever wins the Newcomer Award tomorrow night, we'll find out they're going to get some free studio time in Gorbo Sound. So, you know, it's all ladders and you've kind of got to just be on the ball and it's all about communication at the end of the day. If you're not going to listen to a voicemail, you're, you're wasting your time. You know, don't mess people about. Just be, be real and get on with it. Sarah, do you find that if you, you know, if you need a contact or you're wanting to get in touch with the band, do you feel that um because you've shared stuff in the past with other folk or helped other folk out that they'll they'll take your call or go yeah okay here's an introduction or this is the person that you should speak to for example um well i think because the pop clock's quite a well recognized blog i can i can feed off that that's not my work you know it started in 2007 so i would have been like 14 so i can't take credit for you know its reputation but um if people don't get back to you and you have put an effort and you do have a relationship, then it's a bit like, oh, because you thought, you know, you did have that relationship and you could work on from that and do new projects. And so, yeah, I think establishing a relationship is something that is definitely necessary. It leads to meeting new people and um, moving forward from that. It's, you've just been talking about sharing that when, you know, one of the bands gets in, you know, you like something, you'll share it with all your fans. I mean, do you find the people reciprocate with that? Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. I, th I think um, when it, when it comes to sharing music, it's, it's it's one of these things. That's music is all about connecting. So, and everyone, music is um, everyone likes different stuff. What's the word I'm looking for? <coughs> music diverse. Hi, it's, it's, it's and everyone's everyone's unique. Everyone everyone likes their own stuff. So, uh, yeah. It's a way sharing music. I think is is how you you get onto new music and how you get onto new people as well, whether it be fans, artists, or even genres sometimes. Which is uh, exactly why everyone gets into it in the first place because it's something to get excited about. But I definitely think we your Twitter and your, your Facebook for definitely tagging acts in and getting them shared can go a long way especially when it comes to say if, if you've got a, a release coming out whether it be a new video and you're getting out but you've been sharing another axe one recently it's, it's sometimes it's common courtesy they do that too and if it's all happening at once it can get more of a push on yourself but uh, yeah, it comes down to in the beginning just doing it because that you're into some music and, and if, if you get some repay for it then it's, it's always good I think that uh, what we there's quite a lot of social media questions in here, and I think that uh, we should we should get cover the social media aspect of it because it is uh, after all social. 
Oh, some people are quite anti-social on it. And um, I think this is something that you've, um, you're a bit of a master at, Richie. Richie got something like 90% in his social media exam. They had to get special permission to, to give him such a high mark. Um, so this is, the, this is the man to ask. So, um, you know, are there any things that you would uh, you would be, you'd particularly recommend, Richie? I mean, are there any platforms that you would recommend? And I'd say that there's a caveat for this in the different communities, different audiences tend to f um, be more accessible via different social media. I mean, some of you might have seen that I posted that we'd almost sold as many tickets as we had people saying they were coming to this event. That is unprecedented. <laughs> Normally it's like about a quarter. So um, you've kind of, uh, <laughs> you're the exception that proves the rule. The, what I would say as well though is that we've been doing some youth events called Off The Record and Facebook seems to be an incredibly effective way of reaching those people. So. Richie, what would you what would you recommend? Do you have any particular tips? Do you have a microphone? Don't get it mixed up with your beer. That would help. Uh, okay, so the most uh, bands that I work with and deal with have a Facebook account, and so do a lot of the people I communicate with online. A lot of promoters that I talk to and work with as well. The first thing when they go on the Facebook page, they see this cover photograph, and when I go on it, I certainly like to think that it's up to date if you're doing a wee tour that week i'd like to maybe know because it's the first thing you're going to spot it's relatively big and wide so i mean f one tip i suppose would be just to simply get someone who does graphics or or use an app there's a lot of really cool apps just now um god i forgot the name of those there's one i use it's on my phone and it's fantastic so you can get an image and you select the sizes and you can simply put text over it so that could be hashtag wide days or it could be hashtag discover new music and from there within about five minutes while you're on the bus to work you've got a cover photograph or you could do something else but for me it's about the cover photo I think it's important to have that up to date and then the second point would be the content you put out I think it should be consistent I think if there's big gaps it might it's a bit stuttery it's a bit like Gareth Gates remember that guy so I mean <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think we should have it like, <laughs> I think we should have it like, if you're promoting an event or a particular tour, it should come across like natural and not like over five days, like one post every five days. So keep in mind, like you want your audience to, kind of, to, to be up to date. And if, if you're posting it at the right time, the right content, perhaps photography and video works better than plain text. Maybe that's what will work for you. But if you're, again, a death metal band, it might be, there might be different ways to do it. Um, so th it's about the band's style, certainly, and the time of the post. And I think having a nice cover photo just looks cool because it's the first kind of point of contact for the Facebook page. And then having the contact details on there bloody helps, trust me. The amount of bands you, f you message on there and, uh, you know, it takes about 10, 14 days to get back. You know, that's, that's quite Can shocking. I just say as well, having some music, I hate Facebook for finding out about bands for the record, but um, I'm, I'm kind of one of the rare ones that is like that. But what I would say is the number of times I have to search around to try and find the music on a Facebook page is, is really, um, it's happens far too often, let's put it that way. You can put Bandcamp, into, embed Bandcamp in your Facebook, so that's definitely uh, worth doing because I quite like Bandcamp. But other, you know, you've mentioned Facebook. I mean, do you guys agree? Is Facebook something that you use primarily to, as far as social media is concerned? Nick, is something you do for your your gigs? Yeah, I mean, uh, Facebook's very popular for us. I think we've got about something like 12,500 fans at the moment, and the reach is very good. So if I do a normal text post, it'll probably get seen by a couple thousand people. I can chuck a couple of quid at it and 100,000 people can see it. So that does work very well. Um, but again, it's a matter of engagement. So I have to be putting out content that people care about. And same thing kind of for your band as well. It, it's a good idea to have lots of stuff that's worth seeing. You can post stuff a couple of times. If you've made a video, put it out there. If you've just done a gig and someone videoed it and it looks all right, put it out there. If you've got some content that you're not very proud of, don't rush it out, to be honest. Um, don't go on, put on a bunch of posts for the sake of it when you haven't got any particular news. 
I don't particularly like that. I don't, I don't see bands as my pals. I want to hear the general patter, unless they are very funny. Some people are very funny. Frightened Rabbit are very funny. But yeah, you just want to see a certain amount of relevant content. If I go to a Facebook page, I want to see, I want to see, as I say, the cover photo. I don't pay a huge amount of attention to that. I want to see how many fans they've got, actually. And it's a good idea to try and get fans. You can pay for it. It'll only go as far as people who have heard of you and like you will press the like button. They won't press the like button if they don't like you. Oh, really important. If you've got one of those apps that's not Bandcamp where you have to like it to listen to the music, I will not listen to the music. I will not. I will find any other network to do it. Um, that annoys the hell out of me. Jamie, what about you? Are there any things that you've found particularly useful? When it comes to when we've got shows, like kind of what, what Richie's emphasising on, you've got your latest shows on your, your cover page, your cover picture on your page. That's one of the most important things. What I've found is quite good for if you're, you've got a, a poster for a gig coming up is to tag people in it. And I don't I mean like that. tagging as I'm tagging so in a, a post, tagging in an actual picture. So, and that can go a long way because see when you can pay for Facebook ads, like we've went and tried them out, you can pay two, four pounds and the reach can, can reach anything between two and six thousand. You can get a, a poster fully tagged reaching that and double it for free. So you should be doing that. What, what you try and do is, what I, the way I go about it is go, when you make a, an event page, which are they always the most useful thing on Facebook? But the people that say they're going to that, get them tagged in it, get tagged in people say it's a Glasgow show. You know, Glasgow fans, if you're from Edinburgh or the opposite, wherever you're coming from, you know, make sure they know about it. And the good thing about that is it opens you up to um, certain people who aren't even on your page. It'll say such and such has been tagged on Jamie and Shuni's picture. They'll be like, oh, who's that? Click on it. And then that opens new fans, like friends of fans, that haven't even liked your page to get to, to see kind of what's going on. So that's but I would really say there's a limit to that. And uh, Ali, I'm sure he's got the same problem. Olaf, you probably have that as well. If someone goes onto my personal Facebook to try and look at pictures of me, and I hope they don't, but if they do, they will mostly get gig and club flyers as pictures of me. And I feel invaded at that point. And it can really turn me off. I, that, that's one of my... Bugbears, well, I would say I think there's this general consensus is the you know if you are trying to get in touch with someone the the worst thing unless it's obviously uh, your venues page or it's a work page I hate it when people contact me even my friends contact me on Facebook about work stuff it's like I've changed that here you know this contact me that. on my email or you know my email is my preferred one but mm. Facebook's there for me to rant on and. Um, invite people um invite people to our events it's not i don't really like talking business on it and the other thing to just to add to this as well is if it gets hacked um you're fucked so uh not to put too fine a point on it if they feel you breached your terms their terms you're fucked so make sure you've got back up with everyone's email because that's still um, even though some younger folk aren't really using email as much, at least you've got something, uh, got something there. I would say that you know this touches on something is it, what is appropriate, um, an appropriate way to communicate with a, an individual or a business via social media. Because I think that whilst Facebook seems to be a, a no-no for you know trying to get something out of someone, I feel Twitter, on the other hand, is something that um, a lot of people use professionally and sort of put themselves out on. And that to me seems to be a, a kind of different dynamic. I mean, now you're on Twitter a lot. Um, a little bit, little bit. Are, you, are you quite comfortable with sort of folk um, saying, you know, check out my link or my band? I've got, right, let's start this in a sensible way. I have got my dream job I've got an amazing job so I'm not going to sit and bitch and moan about people that blooming tweet me when I'm on the radio saying check this out <laughs> how is that a sensible thing to do sorry I shouted a lot about that um, how is that a sensible well, thing to do what are they asking do? you to check out by the way is it rude oh, all manner of things right okay but number one thing is have a little tiny tiny modicum of common sense doing a live radio show it's not possible anyway that's my one bugbear it's done it's over i've shared that's okay um when i started radio one i had a twitter account and i think i got it when i was at uni and i was like 
useless. I'll get it. Signed up one night, never used that again. Started Radio 1 and they were like, you need to be on that all day, every day. You need to be using that. You need to be conversing and building an audience. Because that's, you know, essentially what I'm doing as a presenter is building and building and building. And at first I really couldn't be bothered doing that. I was like, this is a piece of nonsense. But you realize the target audience, which is the most important part, the target audience for Radio 1 is used so much. Radio 1 has 1.6 million followers, which for two hours a week, myself and the production team have access to 1.6 million people. We definitely don't get that many listeners at midnight on a Sunday. But if we tweet people that are going bonkers about Harry Styles saying the F word on Twitter or something, if we tweet them and say, you'll get a retweet if you tell us what Ali's playing right now. Oh my goodness. I've never seen so much interaction and so many people suddenly finding out what Found's new record is, is all about. They may not care about it, they may not be invested in it, but at least they've made that step. So that is us in a, in a, in a, in a big, you know, a sort of big scale example using Twitter to our own ends. Um, I've forgotten the question. What was it? Well, here's what. Have you got an appropriate time of day of which people can say, yeah, go and check out my band by Twitter? I'm not here that much. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no. Because it's, it's really easy to find your email. You go yeah. on your webpage really and there's easy. your email. Same for me. Yeah. There I am. It's, I think it's almost like a sense of, y y your question was, uh, is it okay for people to tweet me? Yeah. But it totally is because sometimes I do spend, rather sadly, it's not that rock and roll in existence, sitting in my flat at my desk reading music blogs. So on the side, I'll be on Twitter. On Twitter, if I see something, I'll listen. I'll give it a second. But luckily, maybe the way I respond or the way, the way I sort of present myself, I don't give people like attacking me saying, oh, you've not listened to this, you've not listened to it. Because I do try and listen to as much as I can. And do you know what? I get to play 14 songs if I'm lucky a week from the entire UK. You know, so it's, I like to think people can realise that it's not possible, but yeah, getting tweeted, that's fine. But to expect a response is pretty minimal. It does in pretty large letters on my Facebook say, do not t get in touch here because I won't be able to see it. I've got 3,000 people on my personal Facebook, which was a little error in judgment when I started Radio yeah. 1. Should have started a fan page, but I was like, oh, I don't need a fan page. I'm just, I'm just myself. I don't need that. Really should have done that. Because um, now I've got about probably eight friends in my life that aren't involved in music. <laughs> And the rest is all my people who are in bands. It's pretty sad, but it's true. Um, and the rest are all bands who want airplay. So my Facebook is just a joke. So I'm never going to put, like, I don't know, my best friend who's just given birth a week ago. I'm not going to put photos of me like, oh, it's cute. Whereas Twitter is more of a conversation and there's not that much interaction. But, I mean, my messages bit on Facebook is complete nonsense because it's just not possible to, you know, I yeah, have one I, man. I don't know about anyone else um, on this panel, but if someone emails me, with a really simple email that says, hey, we're a band and we'd like to play, preferably saying so like, we kind of like a support band slot or maybe we'd like to hire the venue, something like that. And they give me a, a two working links, one to the Facebook and one to say a video of them playing live would be fantastic. I will definitely check it out. You go and around I, the house and give I them a I always do. <laughs> no, it's an easy thing to do, but... I, I get a listening day maybe once, twice a week and I'll go through probably 50 bands in a day. It's a session sit down on a laptop and really go hard on it. I'm sure you do it probably four times a day, yeah. you know, four times a week. And I do listen to everything. And I think most people who are a music booker who want to spend some time trying to get the right music will be doing that as well. So as long as you're clear, concise, don't do promise anything to... you can't promise. But if you've got a thing that says, and I think 20, 30 people will come and see us, we're pretty confident about that. That's a real, that's a seller, you know? Yeah. I, was, I was super negative there. But to, on the flip side of that, um, I can't do my job if I don't get new music, I can't do my job if I'm not playing things that nobody's played before. So I do need to interact with these people. It is quite clear online how you can get in touch as an uploader, which is a way to upload music. Also a little tweet, you can do that. My email address is on the internet. Admittedly, it gets a lot of emails, so it takes a while to get back, but there are appropriate professional ways to do that. And, um, you know, I need that as much as a band needs radio play. So it's, it is a two-way street. I am looking for it. It's quite simple to read things and just do the appropriate thing, is, I guess, exactly what you're saying. Um, you, I guess, putting someone's name in helps as well. I mean, that's generally sort of most people's bugbear. Well, if I just get an email starting, <laughs> hey there, then I'm just like, fuck off there. Um, oh, yeah. And it, it, <laughs> it's... Um, <laughs> 
something that even like one of Scotland's biggest PR companies still seem to get wrong. I, now, I think addressing the person personally is an absolute must. And if they don't know your name, at least say, hello, Sneaky Pete's. Hello, Radio One. I didn't know who you were. But in the case of the were, pop <laughs> cop, actually, this is sort of justified because Jason is um, Jason is quite secretive. Um, so when we actually had him here, his name's Jason, but when um, this is Sarah, uh, he's actually been filmed on a panel as well. So he's not quite that secretive. But in those cases, it's, you know, pop cop is OK. But um, I mean, you use, use Facebook a lot, don't you? I mean, I, I see that there's a kind of Facebook... T- Something will go up on PopCop. Um, you know, there is the there's the blog thing where you can post, but I, I notice a lot of people posting comments on on Facebook as well. I mean, is it something that you see more and more engagement with? Definitely. Um, the feature will go up on the PopCop website and then it'll be shared on Facebook and Twitter and then I'll share it on my own Facebook page because I know a lot of people who are into music who don't actually like the PopCop page, so... It might have so many likes on the PopCop page and then separate likes on, on my own, and it means that more people actually get access to it, more people can read it. And so I think it gets people interacting with what you've said, and then like people who are like, oh, Sarah, I never knew you were doing that, and this is what I think, and that's good. And so it reaches people on like a, a, a wider level, you know? I think it's very good. And it, when we were talking about Twitter, the, the, um, the PopCop have like a goss section on the, on the website, which gets updated daily. And um, we've been talking about, oh, should like is, is that necessary? Should we put it up on the website daily, or should we just use that for for Twitter, or should we find a way to link Twitter with that to the actual page to to make it the one thing? Because it'll reach more people through social media. So I think it's a very important part too, especially blogging and things, because it's an it's an online feature. It's how people access it. I think like uh, one of the things just before we change away from Facebook is uh, to kind of view Facebook as an engaging and an interactive one to share. So if you've got something good to share, whether it be through your music, hopefully it's like a a music video or a good song or whatever, and you want to get that kind of shared as to as much people as, as possible, you, there's there's different avenues you can go down. Like I found a couple of times, maybe if you can try and get as many as your, your followers or people that like your page, you're like I've seen you, you do it as well, Richie, and stuff like that. You're running little competitions whether people can share um, certain videos or, or do certain hashtags, whether it be, and that kind of, uh, t- to start a trend or a kind of buzz about a certain thing is the way you can really get social media kind of on your side, but not well, a way to kind of like, um, uh, the, other, the other thing where if you're doing that, you can do it once and then monitor it, evaluate it and try and double it next time. So that way you're progressing and not just, ah, that was okay. Let's do it okay again. Never do okay. Try and how do you evaluate it through the insights or? Yeah, you can do it through the insights and if you're set up to an email address, you know, you can get, let's say you get 40 different new followers from it or 40 new retweets. You can kind of see it from there so you can slowly build towards your next campaign. Something also worth mentioning, I mean, we've focused very much on Twitter and um, on Facebook, but there's, does, do anyone, does anyone use Bitly? Or tiny, do you know what tiny URL is? It's basically you get a long, uh, a really long um, URL, and it, it reduces it for you. But if you sign up to Bitly, you can see who's clicked on it, and uh, well, not who's clicked on it, but where the people are, where the people live, or which country, and you can also see where they've clicked from. So um, I'll put something, that, reduce it in a Bitly URL. Stick one on Facebook, stick one on Twitter, and see which one is actually getting people uh, linking to it. So you that gives you a, a really good insight into it as well. So you're not just uh, blind posting it and not knowing you know, how many folk have actually paid attention to it. I've, so, got, I've got a couple of ways of doing that. And one, one thing that's quite nice is if you're in a, for instance, in a band or whatever it is that you do in the music industry or plan to do, is that you don't actually want to be using Twitter and Facebook all the time as your full-time job because you forget to how to do your job properly and you end up doing other stuff. Uh, there's a couple of apps that you can use. They've both got web versions and they're both free, at least initially, unless you've got an enormous amount of followers called um, Hootsuite. Or, and it does the, what, the URL shortening thing that can allow you to see how many people are reading or not reading your tweets. And the other one is, uh, is called Buffer, which I use absolutely loads. And that means that once a week, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to say, right, over the next 
two, three weeks, I've got this amount of gigs and clubs, and I'm simply going to basically put up a listing. And it puts them out at certain times a day. It'll automatically put them out, say, four of them a day, or you can say, well, I need to announce this show. I've got um, Young Rebel set just played last night, and I put out uh, a notice about two months beforehand. It was on a Monday morning. 9 a.m. is the announced time. It's the official thing we have to do. I didn't get up at Monday at 9. I got up at 2 p.m., as I normally do, because I work Sunday night. Um, but this my tweet went out on time. This is my mind right now. Have you never used I that? I thought you were on Twitter as much as me. Nowhere near. I just feel Nowhere really near. sad right yeah. now. Anyway, it's kind of... <laughs> I've got a robot. I've got a free robot. Uh, it's called Buffer, or Hootsuite is another one as well. And they work across most networks. If you wanted to post on LinkedIn all the time, you could, but avoid. Ah, I was going to say this with LinkedIn. Um, this is quite, um, it's, I actually find it incredibly useful because from a business, you know, when you're talking about business people, and this links in also the question about, you know, approaching sponsors and things. Um, I've obviously, if someone's just got, I'm a, singer songwriter and kind of um with nothing else on linkedin i don't think that's the right platform you know there's there's plenty of other different social media or social elements to um digital services like soundcloud or uh, bandcamp that you can use but linkedin is really useful if you've got a decent linkedin profile and you can you join up and you can then find other people on it and um, connect with them. And I actually find it's, I'm not so sure if I want to have, accept a friend request from someone I've not had a drink with um, or hung out with, but on LinkedIn, I'm totally happy about it because it's like, that's business, yeah, yeah. But I'm thinking more in terms of contacting people. I'm quite comfortable with someone contacting me about something to do with business on LinkedIn or by email, but I'm not, I don't like it on, on Facebook. You do like it on There's Facebook. something really creepy about LinkedIn where you can see who's viewed your yeah. profile as well. Yeah, it's great. I'd quite like to go back to the, the real world and yeah. making connections with people on a face-to-face -face basis because I've actually found that even just uh, meeting someone for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, if I've got the opportunity to do that rather than doing everything by email or over the phone, I will always take that opportunity because that brief connection actually helps you so much in um, subsequent meetings as long as you can remember the uh, the person's face and uh, it helps if you remember their name but uh, the what i would say with that as well is that when you are meeting someone it's quite good to say to them uh hi you know we met at this place or you know this is my name because <laughs> folk do with the best will in the world forget names or you can recognize someone but you can't remember where and that's a bit sort of uh so that can be quite embarrassing so you could put someone at ease pretty quickly by going remember we met there and this is my name and then they can uh you can relax or they can relax rather so i mean i'd like to are there any suggestions that you've got i mean when you've been you know out and about um any good ways of um, making connections when you're out, Jamie? Have you uh, you've done a lot of this? What are your <laughs> can tips? We, can we check really quickly how many musicians are in the audience, and how many people wanting to work in the media type job things promoting? Cool. That's just just. I how many of you? Would, does anyone want to be a promoter? Okay, do it. Any of you want to promote your own gigs? Okay, so that means you can promote us as well. He's, he's a musician and a promoter, um, so that's quite what Jamie's going to say is going to be pretty much relevant to everyone then. Right, so... <laughs> pressure's on. No pressure, man, no pressure. Well, it can, I think everything ties in with everything. So, to, to kind of... And that's it. <laughs> so yeah, no. To use an example, where we that, that I can kind of think because it's in my head right now, was make opportunities and connections with every one every time you meet them, and it's it's amazing sitting here. You got Ali and Richie and stuff. So before before you go and running up to to Ali, try to get your play on Radio One and stuff. Like I was speaking before, say so you can get the fans and you can get the other acts on board. There's there's loads of other ways to connect with people in the community 
and community being the main word because there's actually loads of community stations that you can get involved with because if you go out and find uh, there's loads of community stations that will play unsigned music so instead of just going and doing the research finding out the names so you can email them properly and don't just send them your music send them uh, an email saying I'll come in I'll do a live session so come in, do a live session, do an interview, get to know them, bring them some goodies, whether it be a CD or even a random piece of chocolate or something, and you're making that connection there with the people, so you're getting into the local community presenters and things like that, and when you go in to do your session or whatever, bring one of your mates, have them film it, iPhones are that good these days, that'll do. Get that on your YouTube, get talking about it on your social media so people are aware about it, but if they're only there to tune in at the time, you've got a timestamp with a video and things like that, and it shows that you're, you're keeping active. I think Facebook and Twitter is good, but you don't always get the people at the right time. Use it as a timestamp. Try and use Facebook as like a timestamp to show that you're active, you're being an active musician, you're doing these things. And then once you get a relationship with these um, like community stations, and there's loads of them, I can reel them off. If anyone wants to know about them, come and ask me later. And you can almost do a little circuit of them. And then once you get to know them, you can then go back every time you've got a big show coming up or a new release, whether it be a new single or a video or something. And that kind of um, communication and relationship that you can build, it, it doesn't have just have to be, it can be through people who are in music all the time, who are dealing with, they're doing it as, as like, whether it's a hobby or a job in music, so you can build that with them and sustain it for a long time. And as well as, as well as if you do all the kind of community stations, and I've been talking about this for ages, it all looks good as well for when you go to build an EPK or a press kit, and if you can list them all, and then you'll be surprised at what looks good at a, a, a young, like, new band straight away before you get to Ali and stuff, and then you go, oh, look, look, they've, they've played here on this now. I can go on to YouTube, look, there, there, there are all the stripped back songs or whatever, and it all looks good. So that kind of initial getting into the mode of talking to people, connecting with people, and, and, and just making friends, because at the end of the day, music is all just about connecting, whether it's So what are your song. tips for this? Because, I mean, when I went to see you, you had, like, these guys that looked like, uh, well, they were sort of 50-year-old skinheads that looked like they'd been kind of... <laughs> Um, football hooligans like 40 years earlier or something like uh, well maybe not 40 but 30 years earlier like these giant guys there's these foreign exchange students I mean it's the most diverse audience I've seen in Edinburgh in a, in a very long time and you must be communicating on a lot of different levels to bring in that sort of range of an audience it wasn't the normal friends and family gig it was something where you'd you'd manage to build this um this fan base what kind of tips would you have for doing that i mean if someone wants a 50 year old former football who like they probably still at it actually i wouldn't have wanted to get on the wrong side of them but you know and at the same time have uh you know foreign exchange students and you know this uh this really diverse audience how did you go about that well what happened was, it was kind of emphasizing what was said before um, by Sarah, is, is just being, being yourself can go a long way because music is subjective and there'll be different people who like different things, but people, people are real and people like real communication through whether it's people online emails and stuff, that's all good, but human communication is a big thing. So when you be real to someone, they can, you can respect people of different types ages, whatever, at the end of the day, ev everyone's at one, and music is the one thing that brings everyone together. Whether it even be for three and a half minutes, you can just forget all your worries and your troubles, and that that's what connects people. So that in mind, um, just being real to people, be confident in yourself, and it's, it's, it's being confident is different from being like cocky and arrogant. I think if you like believe in yourself and your music, then that is the first step because if, if, if you don't, then how can you expect anyone else to? So when it comes to getting loads of different people for different kind of backgrounds and stuff, well, as well as all this good stuff of it's chatting to people, uh, we've kind of played in a lot of different places. We, we love doing random gigs. We've played gigs in venues, pubs, strip clubs, superstores, 
busking on beaches, honestly, everywhere. So that goes a long way as well. If you're taking yourself out your comfort zone and opening up to different types of audiences in different places and just try and connect with different types of people and just try to get them on their level and then you can, you can build your own people skills because no one's born a good outgoing person, no one's born an amazing musician, no one's born a footballer, everyone gets to where they got to be by doing it, repetition and getting good at it, so if anyone wants to, to get something, just stick at it. Did you find that there were, I mean, you mentioned chocolate, and I, that immediately sort of lit a little light bulb, well, you might not have noticed it, but that's just because it's blinded out by these spotlights, but I've, um, I've done this on quite a few occasions where you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to a meeting, uh, take a box of uh, Maltesers or pick up a large Toblerone or something. And you can, by the way, this is something um, our accountants told us, you can take this off your tax for those of you who are self-employed. Yeah? Uh, you can't take booze off, unfortunately, because um, up until very recently, I'd, I'd take a bottle of whiskey if I was invited to, to do something at a festival abroad, for example. So. You take something into someone, and it's all you know. It immediately creates quite a nice, um, quite a nice atmosphere because no one else really does it. I mean, did you when you're going in, you're taking chocolate in a radio station? It breaks the ice. So that's what I'm saying. If we're going into a radio station, and I'm sure I brung. I was like, like just before to leave, I'm looking around my room, like, what can I take? What can I, you know, <laughs> you know, a present? I'm sure I found like this. It was like a rubber. It was like shaped like a hot dog, and I was like, this is amazing. Like, who even used these pencils? Like, seriously. So. And, and they thought that was great, and it was a great icebreaker, and you, it just kind of, it gets that kind of, especially when you go in for a live session or a radio talk show, it's supposed to be fun and that, and you get some of the best times out of it, and it makes you want to go back, and it makes them want to get you back, and it's just that type of thing. I think it's for, and my tip would be on talking to people, and it's, like, like for instance, Ali, for yourself, going up to you, I'm, I'm not going up to, to kind of think, oh, there's Ali, he, he, he did a radio, and it's, it's the same as I would go up to another musician. Imagine if you met a musician at a gig, you're, you're not going to just think, oh, what can I get out of them? Can, can, I, can, I, get, can I get their fans? Not, you, just, you just treat them as, as a person as you would chat to them, you want to get friends with them, just like the same as you. And I appreciate chat. that. Yeah, yeah, Thank so you. to chat to you as if it's, uh, we're, we're going to get to know each other, going to have a bit of a laugh, and I think that goes a long way. You, you have to kind of have that mentality, whether it's other artists, acts, or people in any kind of uh, part of the music industry. You just want to be real with them, just be a bit friendly, and, and just kind of take it for there. Have you guys taken any gifts or when you're, you're going into a meeting or say you've got, you, you're expecting a difficult interview, have you ever taken something in like some cakes or something that's going to ingratiate you with the people you're, you're talking to? I think I should maybe start buying rubbers. <laughs> <laughs> we all rub it in the sticks. <laughs> what? Um, no, I've not done it before, but I think, well, if I arranged to meet up with somebody, I'd buy them their coffee, or, you know, if I said, meet me and I'll, I'll buy you your coffee, but I've, I've never brought them a, a present and eat up my game. <laughs> Richie, what about you when you're talking to your, your sponsors? Well, sponsorship, sometimes some companies can't uh, give you funding, you know, we're in a pretty tight place just now, a lot of business. So I'd say we're talking to a hotel, and they want to give me a wee room to stay in Christmas when I'm working in the restaurant and it's really busy, of course you're going to take it. So for me it's slightly different, but I do love chocolate. You know, how do you go about approaching the, the sponsors and um, you know, and what steps do you take to secure initial contact and a response? Cool, well it doesn't happen like that. Um, if it did, it would be easy, but it wouldn't be accurate. Um, you've got to kind of, for me I've got to go through what's going to happen What's happened previously, so the last four years we've went from this to this, um, and now our aims are to go from here to, to here. Um, so we'll make sure that we're in the right environment. I'm not going to meet them in a really busy coffee shop on Buchanan Street. I'm going to go somewhere a bit underground or, or quite cool, you know, somewhere that I would want to be able to talk and be myself. So we do that, and then there's always silly things like being on time, being polite, and then it comes to like the 
the facts and presentation. A lot of what I do, I'm quite a tech geek. Um, I always carry an iPad about. So I present everything on an iPad and it's quite a nice way to, to kind of showcase what you do. It's just like, it's cool. <laughs> if there's Wi-Fi certainly that works, then it makes everything easier as well. But hey, um, so yeah, we kind of simply go through um, what, what I, I would like from the company and then return what I can give. And I'm quite picky in terms of who I, I go for. You know, I'm not desperate Dan. I'm going to, I like quality and I always kind of have. So I, I like to be careful about who we, we have as a sponsor. You know, there's no point in taking the piss out of what I've spent five years creating. <laughs> so we're quite high in terms of what we want. So it takes time and it's about showing them exactly what the hell they're going to get out of it. You know, I don't want to waste their time. I certainly don't want them to waste mine. So we start on the same wavelength and we, we should finish off both pro being good for each other, you know. So tomorrow night you'll see a lot, of, if any of you are at the awards, you'll see a lot of branding around the room. You'll see a lot of like laminate passes with the sponsors. We really do look after everyone. And you'll see us talking about it online. You'll probably see it mentioned on stage, on Twitter, etc. That's the whole part of the deal. You know, that's what they expect. That's what I expect to do. That's my job. <laughs> and I quite enjoy talking about sponsors, brands that I enjoy wearing or staying in if it's Citizen M Hotel. So yeah, I kind of pick who I, who, I, who I fancy and then we, we try our best to, to make it work. And with the Samas particularly, all our sponsors are Scottish or they're based primarily in Glasgow or Edinburgh. And I think that's what makes it really unique and quite special. You know, it's not like we're running about with Vodafone plastered over the walls or I don't know, Nike. You know, it's very Scottish and it's very DIY, which is exactly what the awards are all about. So you'll see a lot of that if any of you are at the awards tomorrow night. I think that with uh, that as well, is it's also knowing um, about who you're approaching, I would say. You know, I think that it's it helps if you're... Um, if like Richie says, if you like um, if you like the product or you like who you're working with, I mean, some things might be difficult to like because it's just a, a very functional object. But um, you know, I like um, I like nice food and I like nice beer. So I think it's uh, it's one of those ones where you could sit there and say, well, yeah, I, I'm familiar with this. This is what we do. This is what what it's all about. And um, you know, hopefully people people will get it. Um, and it's also when you approach some people, they'll be like, we've no money. We hear this all the time. And strangely enough, not from the, the sponsors that we work with on Born to be Wide, but a lot on Wide Days, it's like, we have no money. And it's like, yeah, okay, so this particular bit doesn't have any money, but you're owned by a large recording studio that I know has a lot of money. Um, I know this because they sponsor his awards. And so um, I'm like, and I went to the launch and it's like, well, actually, you're part of the same company. We don't care where the money comes from, but, you know, bring it in from your colleagues there. If they put an advert, you can, you know, we'll do, we'll do a whole lot of stuff on the other things you want to promote as well. So I'd say that's, uh, you know, it's a very difficult thing, though, and that's very much why there's people whose job it is to bring sponsorship in. That's yeah, I think, I think you need to be realistic about it. If you're wanting to run an event in the summer, you should probably have finished your budget about today or next, next week. You know, if you want it to be as big as you're hopefully going to make it, you know, because... These, like even silly things like getting an invoice through and paid on time. Invo Olaf, I'm sure you, you know about this. Like getting paid on time. Yeah, everyone says it's going to happen, and then perhaps it won't. You know, so Spotify. You've, eight you've, months. You've got you've got to have that kind of backup. Like, so where am I going to get the money? Well, luckily I saved up loads of money last year or whatever. So maybe you've got to think University on your feet. University of the West of Scotland, two fucking years, yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's another matter. That's staying in the edit, yeah. Um, <laughs> If you've got a financial model that's currently working and that's attractive and the event's running really well, you'll find they'll come to you after a while. I never got a significant sponsor for the club until maybe three years in. Now I have to choose between who wants to give me the most money and who's most credible. They all tend to be drinks brands, in my experience, because of the kind of event that I run um, and because we make our money essentially out of alcohol sales and not 
uh, live entertainment per se. Um, but I, I, hang in there and they'll definitely come to you, you know, the especially if you're good I'd at advertising. And if you're selling your tickets, you are good at advertising. They will come to you. I, I think that a lot of it has to do with uh, whether people are into what you're doing as well. And then there's a lot more, there's a lot more willing. I mean, I, I heard a great story about what used to be the Donington uh, Monsters of Rock Festival. What's it called now? Is it download. Download. download? Yeah, that's right. And they, um, there was some guy that just loved heavy metal and he owned a shower company and the promoter was like well you know we can't there's no point in you sticking your logo everywhere and then they were like ah but hang on what's really nice at a festival well it's nice to have a shower so they basically installed a a shower block um, is the sponsorship deal, and then you can charge people for the for the showers. But you know, part of it's also finding folk that are really into what you're doing, and then they're they're more likely to they're more likely to want to put money in it. I mean, you see this with the the crowdfunding stuff as well, which you once you get to a bigger level, even on a smaller level, is a is a type of uh, sponsorship. Um, one thing that we've not really covered and um, I would like to sort of ask is just like the, the worst ways that people can approach or what do people get horrifically wrong when they're trying to build a network? Really drunk people approaching you, like in a few out and they're just like... <laughs> Sorry. <They're> just <laughs> You're off the hook, but you, you know, like if someone comes up and they get your, like they get, maybe get your name right, but then they get the, this, like the your business name wrong or whatever, like the Scottish Alternative Music Awards, or they might say something completely off tangent, you know, that's instantly going to kind of turn you off, isn't it? So, I mean, I think not being intoxicated, certainly, yeah, this helps. Sarah? Um, me and Jason, we asked if we could attend the press launch at the Hydro when it was, when it was first opening. And so we went along and it was us and, you know, like the, the press of Scotland, the Daily Record and blah, blah, blah. And it was Admiral Fallow that were playing. And I'm pretty sure we were the only people there who knew who the band were. Uh, <laughs> were you there? there? Apart from band. Ali. And um, this woman came running up to me. She was like all stressed and her hair was everywhere. She was like, are you Sarah? And I was like, aye. <laughs> she was like, can I come ask you a few questions? Because she clearly thought I was the Sarah that was in the band. And I was like, you've really got, you've got the wrong person, you know, so... Um, it comes down to again what we've been saying is just do your research. You can be a professional, have the, like the title of the job, and still not be doing it to the best of your ability. So that's one of my funnier stories. Nick, what about you? Are there any sort of bugbears that you? I have? don't know. I mean, I don't really want anyone chewing my ear in a social situation. But at the same time, I was going to say earlier about you know how you you're talking about communities and stuff. Is there are places where people who love music go a lot. And if you were in Glasgow and you went to Block or Nice and Sleazy or maybe Broadcast a bit, if in Edinburgh, if you went to Sneaky Pete, so probably, you know, you probably know it's a lot of people who love music go to the City Cafe. It's less of a venue per se, but you know that you're going to bump into a lot of the right kind of people. Don't chew anyone's ear off. Don't go, excuse me, I just really... Blah, blah, blah. But you'll, if you're hanging around in places where people in music hang around a lot, you will end up getting to know each other. I think that's a good point. There are also... And do it in a nice and easy way. There are sort of places um, where or events that are specifically set up for that sort of thing, which, you know, I'm going to plug in a minute, but um, of course... You're setting in one right now. There's Is that um, not the point? A month, yeah. exactly. Well, of course, here as well. It's a situation where you're, you know, you should have some sensitivity towards, um, towards it. I mean, I, I can remember going for a drink with Vic Galloway and his then girlfriend and one of his um, other mates. And... The four of us were having a quiet drink in a pub in Tall Cross, and this arsehole came up, um, started banging on a Vic about his shitty punk band. And um, Vic, being quiet in a punk, engaged him, but then this guy who didn't introduce himself to any of us and um, just wouldn't leave. Now, Vic's far too nice. I, I think I'm not that nice. I would. Make the, effort, make the guy introduce himself. If he wants to join our conversation, fine. But I think be sensitive. I mean, all of these people as well, there, there are environments where you 
where you talk shop and then there's environments where you just want to take it easy like anyone else. So, um, you know, 2 a.m. when everyone's just hanging out with friends is probably not the best uh, place to be uh, pushing your band um, on someone that's not actually heard your band yet. You know, you talk about something else and then send them an email. Um, one of the other things when you are at these conventions, even though it's business stuff, um, say if you're at Wide Days or Go North, there's still a way, a way to act and a way not to act. Um, uh, a really good friend of mine who uh, sadly passed away last year, he, um, he used to teach his students to ask everyone for a business card and, um, and ask them what they did, which in theory isn't such a bad idea, but when someone doesn't even look you in the eye, they just grab your lanyard with your sort of name on it and stuff and, and go, Mm, what's born to be wide and then it's like oh what do you do and you know immediately you're just kind of like how much do you weigh you know uh, <laughs> what's why do you want to know why why don't you want to speak to me on a human level before you start launching into this stuff and um i mean there was uh uh, you could always spot his students at events like in the city because they were the ones asking for business cards and asking you what you did rather than getting to know you first. And quite often it's it's nice when you get to know someone and you haven't got a clue what they do. And um, there was one guy, the, this giant American bloke who went to go north for years and I just hang out with him. I didn't have a clue what he did. And then it turns out he's one of the biggest sort of radio pluggers on the East Coast of the States. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's quite good. You know, now we're friends, but we're friends before we actually sort of, I even knew what he, uh, what he did for a living. Um, I mean, Ali, are there any things that um, have sort of driven you mad? Or, oh, there's uh, plenty, there's plenty, there's plenty. But um, Name a couple of the most extreme examples. Well, I named that bloody one about Twitter when I'm on air. Come on, play the game. Yeah, yeah, um, but in real life, you know, in a human situation, yeah? Yeah, in real life, uh, remember that I was out one night in Brick Lane not that long ago in London with about six of the eight friends that aren't involved in music that I told you about earlier on. Um, and someone came up to me that, oh my God, are you Ali McCrew off the radio? I've got this band, blah, blah, blah. And he, to his credit, he didn't spend that long and he happened to have a CD on him and he whipped it out and was like, cool. But man, my mates ripped me for the rest of the night. That was it, just Ali McCrew off the radio. Um, but that guy, to his credit, was pretty decent. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's that much. I feel that it's part and parcel of doing what I do. That's why, I, again, it's why I'm employed by Radio 1, to go and be utterly immersed in the world of new bands and hang out at Sleazy's or go to birthdays in Dalston or go over to the Electric Circus or Sneakies and be completely wrapped up in that so I can go on the radio and go, oh my God, I went to this gig and it was amazing! And it means I will not be a competent radio presenter, but that's what they want to be reflected. And involved in that is hanging out with folk. And that's awesome. So what do you do if you just want to go for a, a quiet night out with your missus? Do you put I don't on know a if you false know, I'm not beard? That famous. Do you put laughing. on a false beard or um, what? Actually, what do you do if you just want to go to a gig and not talk to anyone? Oh, I don't. That's not, that's not a thing. I go to Grimsby or something. Like that. You're going. To <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm kidding. Um, I don't know. It's, it's part and parcel of it. Like I'm, I'm quite a chatty person. Like it's kind of. I don't see it as a bad thing. I think. If I did see it as a bad thing, I would 140% be in the wrong job. Are you, do you have any tricks for making yourself a bit invisible? I mean, like, I, mine is like a oh, big hat on him. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like, no, have, you got a bur have you got a burqa or something? Like? <laughs> I, I tried to get this haircut to see if anyone wouldn't recognize me. No, no, not in the slightest, really. Um, I, I don't really know. It, it kind of is what it is. You know? Jamie, is there any things that, you know, have, have bothered you or kind of disconcerted you when you've been out and about or you've been kind of building up the, you know, your your profile as a as an artist? Uh, just kind of like a, a mashup of everything there when you're out and somebody's steaming and they get your, your name wrong, your band or whatever, and uh, you're out with your girlfriend and they're trying to shove CDs in your face. <laughs> but nah, nah, to be honest, I, I love speaking to people, so if anyone takes the time to speak to me, I will speak to them no matter how drunk or how much they, they don't know about me. 
<laughs> or a band at all. I, I'll you I will usually speak to everyone. So, but um, some sometimes when you you get you meet people, they say, "Oh, can we come and support you?" I'm like, "Yeah, cool. Drop me drop me an email because I'll forget and or you'll forget and they just never follow up." And I always think, "Well, that was just was that was that serious? Like, I'm I'm not going to chase up people as well." So, but but um, that hard that doesn't happen a lot. But uh, when it comes to me, uh, most things go over my head. Like if, if you do sometimes get people who, from a music perspective, that come up to you for the wrong reasons, that maybe not into your band, and I'm just kind of like, all right, well, if you're not into it, it's not for everyone, cool. So it can go the other way as well when, like, um, you might have somebody come up and like say they dislike your music. And I'll be like, cool, so what are you into? And then that explains all. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I think that uh, we should really sort of uh, wrap this up. So now that you can uh, socialize with each other and socialize with us, uh, Sarah's going to be um, on DJing first, uh, followed by Jamie. Give them a couple of minutes just to go and get um, get some crisps and um, some uh, another beer and stick around. Um, I would say that uh, this is something that... Um, is important to mention as well. One of the things we've noticed a lot with Born To Be Wide is that um, people would very often leave straight after the panel and not speak to each other. Um, conversely, there are people that stuck around and when everyone was going out somewhere else after um, after the um, after the Born To Be Wide night, they would end up sort of hanging out with the booking agent or you know the promoter or whoever it was that we had sort of with us because it was, people would just kind of tail off, they'd vanish. Um, I'd like to uh, say a big round of applause for all the panelists, please. <laughs> and do go and speak to them. Don't be, don't be afraid, speak to them and speak to each other because there yeah. are all these promoters and musicians in the audience and that's, uh, you know, they'll be sort of uh, stepping in Nick's shoes in a few years' time or might be on the radio. Can I say uh, like quickly, how... off? Can I say quickly, at risk of sounding like one of those guys that works in Butlins or a fucking summer camp council. You work in Butlins. <laughs> well, things have got... Uh, the only way is down from here. Um, but yeah, I used to come to Born To Be White when I worked at Air 3, the Stirling Student Radio Station, and knew absolutely nobody and sat in the corner on my phone and... I still ended up getting on Radio 1. So don't feel bad about it if you're shy or awkward about talking to people. Like, the right sort of... I like to think that things will come around the correct way. So, you know, networking... Networking can be really fucking awkward. If it feels right, go and chat to someone. If it doesn't, don't beat yourself up about it. There you go. Peace and love and all that. Cheers, guys.